Hello and welcome to another episode of Legends of Interior Expeditions podcast. And in this one, we have good news for you. We've got new Balco data. And Arthur is jo I'm joined here by Arthur and, and by Arthur and Misrael again. And yeah, happy to have you here again. And yes, looking forward to yeah. our discussion. Hello, hello. Hey, guys. Okay, so Arthur, can you tell us what this Balco data is all about? Yep, sure. So um, the data that we refer to now uh, uh, as Balco data um, is essentially named after the person who provides us this data, uh, someone called Balco, who's a data analyst um, uh, on Runeterra data, who's uh, available on Twitter. Um, and uh, so this is quite a, a select sample of data that he collects. Um, so what he does is that he uh, essentially scrapes from the right API um, all the games played by uh, players who uh, hit masters in constructed over the last month or so. Um, but uh, whilst he's looking for constructed data, he also uh, is scraping the uh, expeditions data as well. Uh, so this is the kind of um, byproduct that we get from him. Um, and the idea is that uh, we're essentially getting data from um, the players who are very good and constructed playing in expeditions. Um, and it's also uh, two-sided in the sense that we're also getting the data uh, from the, his opponents as well, uh, from their opponents, the uh, Masters players' opponents. Um, as I mentioned, the period is over about one month. So at this point, Uh, it includes Magical Misadventures. Um, uh, so it does include Canon, Ari, Pantheon, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, something that is uh, quite interesting is that uh, the win rate that we see here is uh, what's called an in-deck win rate. So it's the win rate of when a card is in your deck, um, which some of the times is drawn and sometimes is not drawn. So it's essentially um, a measure of how good uh, uh, a card is when it is in a certain deck or an archetype. So it also speaks quite a lot about how good the region is, how good the archetype or bucket is, uh, in addition to how good the individual card is. Um, I think that's all I wanted to discuss about Balke's data. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> yes, yes, that's a good point. So uh, if uh, the card is ne never drawn and you go 7-0, the card still have seven wins towards this data, even though it was never drawn uh, from the deck. So uh, this is something that can sometimes uh, cause some kind of bias, especially with small sample size. But uh, with the bigger sample size, this should probably even out uh, all around. One important point I think we should mention also that this data is all before the recent balance changes. So uh, some of the cards can be a little different in power level because uh, uh, because some of these cards uh, uh, were changed. I don't think uh, the whole meta changed uh, a lot or even at all uh, with these balance changes. So it shouldn't uh, it shouldn't uh, uh, do anything to a white picture. But uh, so, but cards that got changed are probably a little different uh, than uh, the data suggest. Exactly. And there are like two different lists for one for champions and one for the normal cards. Uh, like one is all the cards, I guess. And there's also a segment one for just the champions. You can just filter up here by match or win rate or play rate, whatever. And we will just talk about some things we have found out about this data tables. As a first point, we want to discuss the champions with the highest play rate and see why this play rate is so high. And you can see here on your screen right now the most played champions, number one being by far Pantheon. This should make you happy, Monsieur, right? We love Pantheon, we love his followers. Uh, I'm not really, uh, I'm not really like Pantheon. I think it's strong, so I sometimes pick him. I I know how to play Pantheon, so I so it's uh, very often seven wins when I pick Pantheon. But uh, uh, but still, I don't like uh, some of its followers, especially Saga Sika. This is uh, my least favorite card in expeditions right now. Uh, and I think uh, Pantheon with this high of a play rate uh, and Shivana also with this high of a play rate uh, shapes uh, meta a, a lot right now in expeditions. 
Means uh, these champions together combined have 22% play rate, 13 and 9, which means every fifth game you should see their Pantheon or Shivana, uh, on average, because sometimes they are together in one deck. Uh, but uh, this means that you often play against this uh, big mid-range bombs, and this uh, means that uh, you should uh, possibly possibly uh, acknowledge that and try to be prepared during your draft. This is why, for example, I think that Silence got a lot, a lot stronger in this meta. Uh, this is, for example, why I like uh, having Hush when I play Pantheon. Uh, this is, for example, why Purify is a lot better, even though it's normally a really bad card. Mm, this is... Uh, this is how this meta is different than than before, because before you had a lot of uh, Tristanas and Poppies and Swarm decks. Right now you have uh, much more uh, much more the Pantheon and Saga Seekers, and you have to have an answer to that. You have to have an answer to Champions also. One of the uh, great answers to Pantheon, maybe the best one you know, uh, that uh, that is available, is right now Concerted Strike. This is also. Why, uh, why this is a very good card right now, uh, because uh, you can hit Pantheon twice and break barrier with first strike and uh, kill him with second one. So uh, I think uh, the this play rate of both Pantheon and Shivana shapes the meta a lot. Uh, when you draft your deck, you have to keep in mind that you can face Pantheon or Shivana, and you have to uh, be prepared, uh, prepared at least, at least to the point that you can deal with uh, with some of the strengths of these decks. I find it interesting as well that the play rate on the Pantheon is so high. It's probably because of two reasons. First of all, he's like a little bit boosted right now because he's a new champion, so he appears more often. And secondly, the uh, people want to play new champions. They want to try out new champions. They know Pantheon from um, Constructed. Like, it's a pretty common um, saying to people who are like, I'm new to Constructed, what should I play? I don't like the spider stack, it's so boring. And we just tell them, just craft Pantheon, it's just three champions, and then you have a good deck to start with. And they just take this two expeditions as well, see the Pantheon, pick it up, and go from there. For Shivana, it's a little bit more, like, she's more established, everybody knows see a squeegee, pick a squeegee. And she also has three buckets in total, so it's just more likely that you face her as well. Although the number of buckets is not really representative, for example, Misfortune has four buckets, but only has a 3.2% play rate because she, Bridgewater is just not a region many people want to play because it's generally regarded as the worst region in expeditions. The third most, champ most played champions like they are all got down to the 6.9, 6.4 range, are uh, actually Riven and Aurelian Soul. And funnily enough, Aurelian Soul's win rate is a little bit lower now, like 54.8%. Uh, and then comes Cannon, which is below 50%, so generally not a card you actually want to pick up. But interesting that Aurelian Soul is still in the positives. I can understand that because it's just a powerful dragon and late game card and easy win condition. As, um, so it's also pretty obvious that Cannon would be bad, but that also of course shows as well that the newer players want well the players want to play the newer champions and not just all the old ones over and over again. I think it's also kind of this boosted boosted player or boosted offering for Cannon. I think Cannon also have a boosted offering, right? Yes, he has. And for example, Rumble, I think they didn't boost at all. So Rumble only has a uh, 2.2% play rate. So I kind of forgot to add this boost to Rumble, sadly. But Arthur, were you surprised about any of these champions on the list? Um, I'm not surprised by Pantheon being at the top because, as you mentioned, um, he is new, he is boosted, so he's going to be popular. Um, and there's two other things uh, kind of innate to him that I think is going to make him popular. One is that um, uh, he's what we call in Magic a Voltron champion, in the sense that you stack a bunch of buffs on him and you try and, uh, like, aggregate, uh, make, you know, uh, a super Voltron-style um, champion or even a Saga Seeker uh, 
make him do everything uh, and win with this uh, one giant um, cannonball uh, thing. Um, second thing is that he has RNG mechanics uh, innate to him when he levels up. Um, so uh, we're all card game uh, uh, card gamers here. Um, there is uh, we do enjoy a bit of variance, and sometimes it's a kind of like a chocolate box. You don't know what you're going to get with Pantheon. He levels up, and you hope you know he gets spell shields and make sure that he doesn't get um, uh, to uh, hope sure uh, he doesn't get vengeance or something like that. But it's kind of exciting just to see which keywords he's going to level up with. Um, so those kind of mechanics uh, makes me uh, kind of understand why Pantheon is so popular in terms of play rate. The other thing about sorting by play rate is that uh, play rate here is going to be influenced by uh, win rate slightly as well, in the sense that um, uh, as time goes on, the um, uh, the cards that uh, win more are going to get played more because uh, the ones who uh, win less are just going to get knocked out. Um, and especially when you get up into, you know, um, six wins, seven wins, uh, the uh, decks that you're going to be facing against are going to have uh, champions and cards that are also winning very highly, um, which means that it kind of compounds that effect, which means you'll see a slightly higher play rate. So the fact that we actually have some relatively lower win rate uh, champions like Kennen and Teemo uh, and Tarek really shows uh, their popularity um, and their uh, uh, maybe their bonus offering um, rate just because uh, they've had to overcome the fact that they don't win, rate, uh, win very much but still have a consistently high play rate actually a very good point because in expeditions you of course like you said get knocked out if you go like two wins and two losses in a row so that's a really good point to bring up that it's influenced like that i didn't consider that at first i also find it interesting that yasu is quite high on the list like these number 11 if i count correctly and i wouldn't have guessed that because many people like of course he's paired up with canon but I guess still a lot of people want to make Yasuo work. And the end of the list is, of course, filled with some uh, real bad champions. Mokai, Pai, Gregsai are all filled with, like, um, or considered just unplayable in expeditions. But funnily enough, Vladimir and Katarina are cards that I really like picking and I don't think deserve that low of a play rate. I'm not a huge fan of either of those, so... <laughs> <laughs> But Katarina can just do, like, a decent aggressive deck. Of course, I don't want, like, three or four copies of it. Maybe that's also a factoring in. But, for example, Vladimir decks or Aphelios decks can work. But maybe I'm just, like, a lunatic who wants to make everything work. Uh, probably. <laughs> 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 uh, I also no, not a big fan of Katarina. I like Vladimir, though. I uh, often pick Vladimir. I like this uh, this champion for some reason. <clears throat> And I often uh, try to make work Vladimir from the uh, from the bottom uh, champions. I probably <clears throat> play the most Vladimir. Probably Tamkanch would be here. Elise. Elise is. Strong, uh, is pretty strong in win rate and uh, very low on play rate, so uh, this shows that there is a potential. Uh, so, <clears throat> and of course Vi, and of course Vi is also pretty low, and I try, uh, try a lot of uh, Vi normally. I just have to share this anecdote that I really hate Vi, because whenever you do some data analysis, whenever you search for Vi, you have like 10,000 different things showing up, because for example, Diego shows up, And all the different cards have like a Y in it, and it's like really hard to find her. So I should have has like gave her a real name, like Violet or something, and then it would have been very easy to find her. <laughs> <laughs> the problems of, of drafters from first world. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, 
if nobody wants to add anything to the champions, then we can. Uh, move I would on. Okay. I would add something. I think uh, also I would <clears throat> I would uh, uh, take a note about Cannon here. He being uh, such a high play rate and such a low win rate uh, in comparison. I think this uh, this uh, might affect a little bit one of the uh, one of the places that places that we're gonna discuss a little later because Cannon being very uh, very high play rate and very low win rate makes uh, makes win rate for some um, for some decks inflates because uh, if uh, if uh, Karen is performing badly he's going to start to be picking less and less uh, in, uh, in the next rounds and then match the champions the matchups that are better uh, that are good versus Canon uh, having right now inflated win rate and uh, and this win rate is higher than it should be when uh, Canon stops being so prevalent and stops uh, showing up so often this win rate is going to drop a little bit so in the uh, next uh, in potentially next bulk of data when when Canon's play rate should be lower I suppose uh, then uh, the win rate of this uh, this uh, champions would, uh, would also drop a little bit since uh, good matchup is not going to be prevalent so much. Yeah, I have to agree that Canon is like one of the champions that I counter a lot with like random region combinations and he just doesn't really do anything ever, or at least I didn't see it. I had like a fun deck myself in Monastery of Hirana, like two monasteries and bouncing cannon multiple times a turn. But that was more of a meme deck than a real run. Yeah, I, I, I was playing once cannon deck to seven wins. I drew, uh, bring, uh, brought him to seven wins, but playing decks with Bundle City and I had like six Bundle Commanders, I think. So this was the real win condition. And cannon was just a random one, one to one pick a deck. <laughs> Have you have you guys heard of the constructed player who brought sunk cost to number one in A? Like that's pretty big news. Because like in Canon Ari you can just play two of any card and he just included two sunk cost and literally made it to the top place of the North American ladder with it and constructed the top place of Masters. <laughs> and now sunk cost is like <laughs> the, the top played card in this game. <laughs> the, <clears throat> this meme is quite prevalent uh, uh, in card games. Uh, I think some somewhere around half a year ago, uh, one of the best handsome players, Gabi, uh, brought uh, Priest with uh, uh, with zero mana one one with one of the worst cards in the game uh, to number one legend uh, in Hearthstone. So yeah, this this is a normal meme when the deck is so strong that you can play any card and you just show any card and uh, and post the list on Twitter that this list is great. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to do the Vassilian. I'm just going to draft Cillian in like Mono de Marcia and make his win rate go up because I like Cillian. <laughs> okay. So let's move on to the individual cards. Again, you see on the screen sorted by play rate. And we kind of want to just talk about all of these different cards, why they are so high on the list and played so much. And the first card is just the Pale Cascade. And I really like the design of this card. And it's, of course, a very strong card, very powerful card. Gives an LA plus one plus one and Nightfall draw one. So what do you think is the reason why it's so high? I think there is... Uh... Uh, of course, card is powerful, <clears throat> widely prevalent in Pantheon decks. It's really important for Pantheon decks for the most popular champion. This has great synergy with Saga Seeker because you play uh, Saga Seeker on two. Uh, if you don't have uh, uh, an attack token, you play Saga Seeker on two and then play Cascade to win the combo with combo trick um, and draw a card as well. But uh, I think part of the reason might be. And the same part, the same part of the reason why uh, cheaper cards are more prevalent on the list, uh, cards that you see from the opponent's side. Because uh, if you track games uh, for bulk of data, you, you don't see full uh, opponent's deck normally. Uh, you see only cards that uh, opponent played. I think I'm correct about that. Uh, so uh, this is there are cards. Some, there are some cards that are cheaper, and in most of the games against Pantheon, most popular champion, uh, Pale Cascade is actually played. So uh, since it's very prevalent, it's uh, very important and very popular in Pantheon's deck, and it's um, almost always played uh, when you play against Pantheon. Uh, this means that the card is popular. This is uh, why normally cheaper cheaper cards are high on the play at least. Like Gift Giver is so high, uh, for example, also. 
Yeah, that's a good point. Like Pegasus Gate is usually just in four buckets, the two Diana buckets, which see not that much play, uh, the Mimi Taric bucket, and then of course a new um, Pantheon bucket. So I would uh, mostly fault the success of Pantheon and many people trying him out for the high success of the Pegasus Gate as well. I think it's. Um down to the offering rate uh, as well. Um, uh, that whole uh, bucket getting a bonus uh, offering rate and the fact that uh, Pantheon is new, so people uh, want to play with it more, um, ends up uh, with Pale Cascade being played a lot. I'm not sure about how Balco tracks um, the cards because I believe through Riot API you can track both sides the entire deck. Um, but we can double check with Balka uh, afterwards about that. Uh, it's not like the uh, Law Guardian tracker, which um, can only see what the opponent has played, but um, we can double check with him. And the Law Guardian tracker can also track what your opponent's full deck is, but only if they have a deck tracker installed, because there were like um, websites like Runeterra.ir who showed you the whole deck of the opponent during the game. And just had knew immediately what you had to play around, for example. And Riot wanted to stop that and wanted also to like be, make you able to decide if you want you want the deck to be shown or not. So if you don't install the tracker yourself, I think, then you your deck doesn't get shown. But if you have a tracker installed, then your deck your full deck can be shown by other trackers as well after the game. Okay, so The second card on the list is Zenith Blade. And I think the reasons for Zenith Blade being that high are basically the same. Everybody playing Pantheon and everybody wanted to make it work. Zenith Blade actually a really popular card in Expeditions. It's in seven different buckets. The highest number of like buckets you can be in is eight with Glimpse Beyond. And Zenith Blade is like up there now and it's just really prevalent. And it's a decent card, I would say. Like it's certainly good with Pantheon and decent in other decks if you have like multiples. What's your favorite yeah. number with Zenith Blade? Like how many do you want in a deck? Two. Two. Not two. three. Just two. Yeah. I you like three. Draw, you play uh, first uh, to draw second, and uh, that's all. You don't need to normally more, I think. But uh, because if you have three, it's more likely to draw something. But uh, to be fair, if I should be honest, I would probably say that zero is my favorite number. Uh, <laughs> Because I <laughs> I am not really a big fan of this card, and I think the same is uh, about the same about Pale Cascade and Saint Blade and Pantheon Gift Giver Crescent Guardian or Crystal uh, Crystal Ibrex is probably true that Pantheon is popular, so this all these cards are popular also, and so I think this uh, this uh, this all is true for all of these cards uh, here. I don't think that we should. Uh, I'm not sure if there is reason reason to repeat uh, ourselves. I think it's okay. the same. Let's them. move on to the different non-Pantheon or non-Targon cards here. And the first is, of course, our beloved Screeching Dragon. And if you've ever joined a co-op draft before, you know I was saying, see a Screechy, pick a Screechy. And it seems like a lot of people follow our advice because Screeching Dragon is the third most played card, despite it being well, five mana not played card, but card in the deck despite it being a five cost card. And it's also like in five different buckets, so you are pretty likely to find one during your drafts. And if you pick everyone up, it's just a really powerful card, just this mid-range interaction tool. And yeah, probably also relates to how Shivana has a very high play rate. So Switching Dragon just sees a lot of play as well, although it has a little bit of a lower No, it doesn't have a lower win rate. Cineblade has a low win rate, but Switching Dragon is still at 57.8%. So not that oppressive as many people think, but still 57% is 57%. So see a Screechy, uh, pick a Screechy. Uh, I think this high of a win rate for a so popular card is actually oppressive. Mm, card is popular, so people play around it. Uh, and this is the reason why win rate is not like skyrocket high, just very high, right? Uh, I think this is the reason, not, uh, not because card is surprisingly low. I think the high play rate is uh, is what makes Screechy Dragon a little bit worse. 
in the mid range because if it's played too much, everyone is playing around it. I mean, and this is probably true for cards like single combat as well, that is fourth on the list, and you're gonna talk about it also. I'm not surprised that Screeching Dragon is so popular. Uh, as as you said, uh, CSPG pick a Screech, it's a strategy that never failed me, and uh, I doubt it's gonna fail me any uh, in any point of the future. Yeah, it's actually interesting with the single combat because we like sing I've discovered that they still are like sometimes shaping the bucket a little bit or changing the bucket a little bit in the background because and they just recently added in the single combat for Malefic Descent. They also added in Whirling Death for Battle Scars, just some weird cards getting changed, like definitely maybe with um, some patches, some small updates. But it's like the, the it's a single combat, Malefic Descent, and the World Death and Battle Scars where just changes that definitely didn't exist like three months ago had to be included like recently because I've drafted a lot of Shivana, I've drafted a lot, and I've watched a lot of people draft and they just didn't ever get single combat offered and now they do. So this is a card that also lives in a ton of card pools. I think it's also like six or seven now. So really popular and a card you should always play around if you face Demacia, single combat. Always think about what is if they have a single combat? I think a lot of this, um, especially given that the win rate is an in-deck win rate, kind of works together. Um, so we see Screeching Dragon, Shivana, Single Combat, Egghead Researcher, uh, all having pretty high play rate and pretty high win rate. Um, I would attribute some of that uh, high play, uh, high win rate uh, high play rate to that win rate in the sense that they're doing well, so they're uh, sticking around longer, so that survivorship bias is there. Um, but I would say probably before Screeching Dragon and before the Dragons and the Fury, single combat was uh, not really that good before. Before I guess it used to be how maybe Fiora finished off uh, uh, certain small creatures or something. Um, but ever since uh, Screeching Dragon and the rest of the Fury Dragons came in, uh, single combat has become a lot more powerful. And uh, I would say, uh, yes, um, a common with such a high win rate and such a high play rate is kind of oppressive. Ever since Screeching Dragon got released, um, he's probably been the strongest common uh, that we've seen. Um, and his strength basically comes from the fact that uh, he's a kind of uh, an innate two-for-one in the sense that uh, he comes down, eats something small, and then uh, trades with something uh, medium-sized. Sometimes he might even be able to do that, uh, eat two, thing, uh, two small things before uh, trading with something medium-sized. Um, so that's how essentially Demacia and mid-range uh, decks manage to get their advantages on the board just by constantly doing these two for ones until they eventually win the game. Um, and Screeching Dragon is a big part of that. Um, comparing Screeching Dragon to Shivana, you were saying that uh, uh, Screeching Dragon's strong because of Shivana. I feel like it's almost the other way around in that Sh Shivana is strong uh, because of Screeching Dragon. Shivana on turn four uh, without a Screeching Dragon backed up um, is still fairly vulnerable on the defense and doesn't level up that quickly, uh, but backed up by Screeching Dragon levels up very quickly. Um, and I feel like uh, Screeching Dragon is kind of the reason why Shivana is so strong. Unfortunately, I don't see um, kind of a path out of this for Expeditions in the sense that uh, in Constructed, um, he's not oppressive enough for them to... Uh, look at and deserve uh, a buff or weren't an eye, uh, sorry, over enough. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, so I don't foresee a time when Screeching Dragon gets nerfed down to a 4-4 four, four, or maybe even gets um, rarity shifted into a rare or something. Um, so I'm not sure uh, if there will ever be a time when Screeching Dragon will um, be less oppressive. The only thing I can think of is that they reduce the number of uh, buckets that he's contained in, but that requires someone from Riot looking at uh, expeditions balance and balancing by buckets. What if you just remove Screeching Dragon from expeditions at all? <laughs> it's a little bit um, radical. 
I think if we essentially rotate him out, um, I don't think it would be a bad idea. It would change the meta quite considerably, but I'm in favor of rotation, and I think it is inevitable that we will get rotation um, uh, in Runeterra, and if anything, it keeps the metagame fresh. Um, the limited metagame changes, rotates essentially every set in Magic, um, and rotates quite frequently in Hearthstone as well. Just It's only because Runeterra is such a young game that we can deal with, you know, a thousand cards in Expeditions, but when we get to 10,000 cards, 20,000 cards, whenever that will be, um, it would make sense to uh, rotate the limited mode as well. So. Um, one of the biggest problems with like rotating Switching Dragon out is that it's like the uh, only common in the Master Dragons, the other one being the Stalking Boot Mother. So you took a lot of power away from Shivana. You would fully rely on the Agate Research to get the dragons. And I think this would actually make Shivana like really bad, or at least like Maokai level um, bad. Like she's still, still a good champion on her own, but she just never levels up on her, on her own or really hard to do so. I think that would be like a significant nerf that would throw Shivana down quite a lot. Uh, I don't agree with that, that it would be Maokai level. Uh, <clears throat> Shivana is part of Demacia. You can be bad, bad on, on your own, uh, and if you are Demacia, you are still good champion like Fiora. There is no way that Shivana will be Maokai level ever. Uh, I, I, I highly doubt any, any Demacia champion, in, no, no matter how bad it would be, uh, would drop people 50% win rate right now uh, with this, uh, this card pose. Mm, even if uh, even if removing Screeching Dragon from the game. I think it's the other way around. I think that the mass is strong because Screeching Dragon is so strong, but like I think that's a really big point. Like I think also the mass would drop like three percent down if it's like without Screeching Dragon. Uh, I don't think it would drop uh, drop enough. Uh, even though Screeching Dragon is super strong, it's not uh, uh, it's the, the, it's not it's not possible that single card can carry one region so much. There's no way. Still, there's still a cat researcher, still single combat, still a concerted strike. There's still a lot of good cards in the Masia. It's not that easy to uh, to nerf a region just by removing one card. I mean, Saga Seeker made Targon much more much better. So uh, if you remove Saga Seeker, it probably it probably makes a big difference. But um, I don't think it's uh, it's the same with Skitching Dragon. We will probably never find out. Okay, another card that stands out here on the first page that isn't either Demacia nor Targon is Whirling Death. We can quickly take a look at this card. This is also one of these cards that is in eight different buckets now, so you are really, really likely to see it in your Noxus runs, and it's just a really powerful and strong effect. Like the only time Whirling Death is bad is when you get um, have a unit that's like a backline unit, for example, like Seraph or a Aphelios, then it can be hard to use a Whirling Death to kill that specific unit, but usually in Noxus you have ways to force that unit to combat with like challengers and other stuff, so I can de definitely understand why Whirling Death has such a high play rate and also a pretty decent win rate. Uh, yes, I fully agree. I think uh, this is uh, the best removal that Noxus have uh, right now, and the uh, card is very strong. I uh, um, I almost oft always pick Willing Death. Uh, it's really hard for me not to, if I, even if I see Willing Death with, uh, with a bad card. And this is also what uh, other players do, like you can see. And uh, Willing Death is strong. It's, uh, it's uh, one of the stronger win rates, 55, so it's high. Mm, so. Uh, so uh, will in death being uh, being this this good uh, good uh, removal in so many buckets? It's not surprising at all that it's so high in play rate. Okay, and if you look at the second page that you see right now, then we see some more interesting cards to talk about, and the. The first one that's kind of interesting, we talked about it multiple times, Saga Seeker, not OP, confirmed, only a 53% win rate, so <laughs> totally balanced and fine card. Yeah, uh, I think that the uh, problem with Saga Seeker is not uh, that 
um, like um, Omega powerful uh, because there are strategies that can counter it effectively. There are cards also that counter uh, Saga Seeker effectively, like the one that we see right above Saga Seeker, Hush. Uh, it's a great counter to Saga Seeker. And the problem with Saga Seeker is that uh, Saga Seeker very often uh, shuts, uh, shuts down aggressive strategies by himself. Uh, very often you cannot uh, really attack with anything, or you have to all, almost always you know, give give up one unit to Saga Seeker because um, they are always can block with Saga Seeker and buff its uh, health or attack or buff and uh, and trigger fight it again. So so you are trying to attack around Saga Seeker, you are losing your units, and uh, finally Saga Seeker grow enough to kill you on turn like eleven or something because you never can kill Saga Seeker if you don't have you know, a specific tech tech removal for this card. Uh, and this this uh, leads us to uh, to pretty uh, bad and frustrating play patterns. Uh, since I I like initiative focus decks, I like aggressive decks, I like to kill my opponents fast. I like to win ten five six. And Saga Seeker is the card that uh, that is uh, I I think the best in the format to prevent that. Uh, I even think it's stronger than Avalanche in this uh, in this matter. Uh, and this uh, this is what makes Saga Seeker um, card that, uh, such an oppressive card uh, at least for my uh, my type of play style. So which regions of aggro are you having trouble against Saga Seeker with? Uh, mo most of the regions that I try and play uh, aggro. Maybe not Noxus. Noxus is pretty good because of five attack units, but, but when I try like aggro Shurima or when I try uh, going aggressive with Bundle City, uh, very often it's really hard to uh, to break through Saga Seeker. I have to use like uh, cards like Minimorph to get rid of it uh, normally. But why does your aggressive deck have a minimorph? Uh, you always have minimorph in this meta. I mean, in Bundle City, right? If you if you are offered cards like minimorph, you should pick it in this meta because it's a strong answer to Pantheon, Saga Seeker, Shivana, and other big champions. But you don't really want to play a minimorph in your aggro deck, I think, because it's like a slow card and it puts you back on tempo. Like, you want to just attack and stun Pantheon maybe for one turn. I would rather have a, like, it might sound stupid, but if I want to play aggro Bandle, I would rather have a, like, the five mana stun card than a Minimorph. I don't even know the name of this, the Horizon thingy. The, the event, event Horizon. Event Horizon, flip card. Event Horizon, right? Yes, like, I would rather have this than the Minimorph, because Minimorph is just such a bad tempo card. It's in Constructed, it's only played in, like, control decks and not in aggro decks. Uh, it's a little different, right, in expeditions, since uh, um, uh, since your decks are normally more more mid rangey Sometimes you play um, aggressive mirrors with some problematic champion on the other side. Uh, so uh, minimorph uh, can sometimes be useful. Like for example, if I play against Noxus with Swain, it's a really useful card then. So uh, so I think uh, I think minimorph is still a good tech choice. And also Pantheon is really hard to beat for uh, for stuff for uh, cards like. Uh, for uh, aggro decks like Bundle City, so again, uh, Minimorph uh, is a good answer to that. Okay, <laughs> I guess we have to have different opinions here, and because like I don't like Minimorph at all, like not, not at all, all I only like it in slow decks. Like in Darkness, for example, I would pick up a Minimorph or two, but I would never pick it up in an aggressive deck. Okay, um, also I think Swain is like a it's not really a, a popular of a champion to. Play around or pick around. If I run into a Swain, I'm like happy that I found one and even want him to it's win. It's like, it's like uh, example, right? There's uh, yes. many champions like that, right? It's like fine. the most of everyone Pantheon, for example, is also a really good target for me. So now that we've talked about Abandoned City already, let's just move on to like the um, two cards that are the most popular. And those are the Yordle Squire, the one mana two one with the spare and the shield. And then we have the um, Contrologist. And both of these cards are in almost every Bandle City card pool. They are in like six card pools each. And I think there's like seven or eight Bandle City card pools in total. So just by that would alone would explain to me why these cards are so high on the list of playing. Because everybody playing Bandle will at least see one or two Contrologists. Not that often because it's like a rare, 
but at least one or two yardless squires have seen decks with like eight yardless squires. So makes sense that this card sees a lot of play to me. Yeah, they are both in six pockets, I think, uh, according to my quick quick check. Yeah, I, I, I counted them before. They're both in six pockets. So I've got a list which takes into account the offering rates of each of the buckets as well. And Yordle Squire is the one is the one card that is uh, has the highest offerings during the draft uh, pick with essentially thirteen point five times, um, uh, assuming the uh, offering rates is um, uh, as high as they uh, were before. So. Yeah, that would probably also affect this. And if you draft like Canon, you want early game and you like control it just because you can recall it. So people probably prioritize these two cards over others. Um, also with Rumble, if you want to draft Rumble, you want to have these cheap card generator cards. Uh, yes, the other squad is not uh, it's popular, but it's also um, it's also a pretty good card. It, I think it's it's a powerful one drop because. Uh, the ability to generate another card that you can potentially use as a as an option to trade uh, something better with um, something like Challenger as an option to uh, discard for um, Rambo or Bundle Painter or other discard cards or as an option to just um, just pass on high mana just by playing the focus spell and click OK so your opponent uh, have uh, initiative and have to do something. Um, I think this is. And this is uh, very useful having uh, this bonus card in many situations, and this makes your disquire uh, your disquire an okay card and okay pick. And I like to uh, and I like with my bundle city deck to play uh, a card on turn one, and this is the best unit that I can play in bundle city on turn one. Your disquire. Yeah, I like your disquire for the same reasons. Um, a two one is what you want on turn one rather than a one two, and. Uh, Having that extra card, even if your two one trades for another one two, or a two one, or maybe even a three two, um, is something. It's a bit of uh, maybe a one point five for one also. Um, curious what you guys think. Do you guys? Uh, what do you think your pick rate is between uh, sword and shield from your little squad? I typically only play. Uh, you are described to play aggressive deck, so I always pick the spear. Yeah, Not the spear. Yeah, yeah uh, I almost always also pick the spear. Uh, I think the uh, what uh, what influences my choice is if I'm a bit down in the matchup or if I'm in control. If I'm a bit down in the matchup, I'm almost always want want spear. If I am uh, control, I was I more often want uh, want shield. Mm, and since the other squire is as common set in aggressive decks, normally uh, I almost always pick spear. I can uh, I can probably say it's like ninety ten or something like that of the this this proportion. I faced a deck once with like six yardless squires and Fiora, and they picked they drew five yardless squires and picked shield every time, and then buffed the Fiora by like five health, which like found pretty funny and actually a good strategy. But on average, I would also always go for the spear. Yeah, I also almost definitely almost always go for the spear. If I'm not sure, I will go for the spear. And I will go for the shield only if there is a specific card that I want to buff to make sure that in combat it survives. Um, so Fiora comes to mind or anything else that uh specifically for example has four health and they have a four attack and i want to essentially have a focus speed uh shield and then an uh, open attack after that then i might consider a picking shield but if in doubt a ton one i'm picking spear uh, I remember one good example when I played uh, Yodel Square in a deck and I was playing Yodel Square on one and always picking shield uh, in a deck. Uh, when I played Darkness and I had Yodel Square, so I was always picking shield on uh, Yodel Square one. And normally this shield went uh, to Vigar or Senna and later uh, to buff uh, half of the units. I find interesting that we value this health uh, like this. Um, attack buffs so much higher than the health buff if you think about it. Like for example a 2-4 um, would generally be regarded better as a, than a 4-2, right? Do you think? I would generally want a 2-4 more than a 4-2 in my deck, like without any keywords. 
I'm not sure. I think I would prefer a 4-2. I also would prefer, prefer a 4 2. I even can uh, provide an explanation why, why Conan thinks differently because Conan doesn't play aggressive decks, so he plays only controls. So uh, for him, 2 4 normally takes two traits and 4 2 only one. So if he plays control, uh, it's not enough value from 4 2. Interesting. Like, my, my, I think this is still for my Hearthstone area. Like, in Hearthstone, you want like a 3 5 way more than a 5 3. I don't know if it's true anymore, but. We used to have it like in, back in the old gods matter. We had like a three five and a five three, or like a three five and a five four. It was both have taunt, sentient shield master or something, and the other guy. And generally, the three five was regarded as better than the five four, if I remember correctly. So it's just uh, more. Yes, yes, that's true. Half uh, is much more important than starting headstone, uh, but that's because but, but that's because uh, you cannot block uh, the other units. This is the reason. Okay. Yeah, I guess it makes sense. So in this game, just health, uh, just attack is a little bit more important than health. Then I have to rethink my values I've learned from this old game that nobody plays anymore. <laughs> except like, uh, except like a three digit, uh, two digits amount of millions players. So yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Then the next card, not from Bandit City or Targon is Armor Tusk Rider, and actually lied, I just checked before that, um, Armor Tusk Rider is the card with the most buckets now, with 9 in total, so basically, I think there's 14 Noxus buckets, or 15, and Armor Tusk Rider is a 9 of them, and it's just the backbone of the region, I would say, a really strong card, of course, Noxus is usually played as an aggressive region, so you don't really want that many 6 drops, but I still think having a, a few Armor Tusk Riders in your deck improves it by so much. I agree. Armor Task Rider is one of the best things that you want to have on the top of your uh, fast, fast mid-range curve. Uh, so uh, this is the reason why it is uh, also picked a lot and uh, why win rate is pretty high. So uh, I think this is a good card and uh, it's uh, it's picked uh, a lot because uh, just because of that, because it's good. And the ability to uh, to be very powerful in aggressive mirrors is also really important because in aggressive mirrors it's pretty hard to answer such a card like Armored Task Rider. Uh, and Armored Task Rider, uh, I, I found myself a few times or maybe even more uh, games when uh, I just uh, couldn't answer Armored Task Rider and lost to it when they played on six. I mean, in aggressive mirrors, of course. It reminds me so much of a lot of the rings with like the white building in the background and the elephants coming, like the final final fight of a lot of the rings where these gigantic elephants came in. So that's also nice flashbacks. I only think about uh, about uh, the, this that you often say elephant in the room when I see a task rider. I think about this card like that, but I don't want to see it from my opponent's side. <laughs> okay. And another card that's really played a lot is Glimpse Beyond. And Glimpse Beyond was my original example of being in eight buckets. And I usually like, what is your favorite number on Glimpse Beyond? I usually like, like one or two at most. I don't really go that much onto this card. I don't really think of it as that strong. The first one is really good. The second one is also okay. But once you go to three or four, it really drops down in value, in my opinion. Depends on the deck, of course. But like in your average deck, it's not a full Viego build around then I would say that I don't really like it that much. Yeah, I remember back in the Foundation set when Glimpse Beyond um, was a very consistent way for uh, Shadow Isles to get card advantage at the same time as um, responding to removal or maybe getting value out of uh, Curse Keepers and so on and so forth. Uh, but unfortunately over time this has been at power crept and now um, there are better ways of getting uh, card advantage, uh, uh, so I do think it's kind of left less than now. Also, only a fifty-two percent win rate, so not even that high. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, I'm I'm also the, not the big fan of Limps Beyond. I'm not playing this uh, this card a lot, uh, uh, but I also don't play a lot of Shadow Eyes, so maybe this is this is part of the reason. Uh, I am not even have can answer the question how what is my favorite number of Limps Beyond. I just <laughs> don't know. Similar to me, never playing Battle City. You play never Shadow Eyes. 
Okay. I think I play Senna a lot. If I see Senna, I'll always pick Senna, but uh, I don't have a lot of games beyond to Senna normally. And then the last card on our second page is Concerted Strike. And I've said before, this is one of my, like the cards I dislike the most. It wasn't included in the first in Demacia. And I feel like it really breaks Demacia's region identity because it's the only one-sided strike. And it's also the best one-sided strike in the game. And like one-sided, I mean, the other unit doesn't strike back before Demacia had single combat, which is basically a mini challenge. And Cataclysm is basically also a mini challenge. But Concerted Strike is the only one-sided strike effect that Zemasia has. And it's really overpowered in comparison to other strike effects. If you look at, for example, the Boomerang Blade, it's a slow speed, seven mana, and one unit targets two. So if you remove one unit, it's like way more vulnerable to any interaction. And even like Wild Claws, I think it's called in Noxus is an epic, five mana, slow speed, and ally strikes an enemy. So historically, those one-sided strike effects were really powerful. And now we see that Concerted Strike is basically played more than Vengeance even, because it's just like oftentimes a better version than Vengeance, I would say, because it's cheaper and it allows the units to level up. And it's one of these cards that are really overpowered to make a region that's generally weak and constructed a little bit more powerful, is my guess but it just makes it so obnoxious to play against in expeditions. It breaks barriers, it has so many interactions. And I, it's like, if I would make a list of my three most disliked cards, one of them would be Concerted Strike. Not because I don't like playing the card or because I think it's bad, but because I just don't enjoy the design as much. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about design. I don't have any strong, strong feelings about this card, but uh, I agree that it's very powerful. I think it's also, it's specifically very powerful in this meta since uh, uh, it's one of the best answers to Pantheon. Uh, they, they play Pantheon and you immediately can answer uh, with Concerts and Strike breaking the barrier, barrier with first strike and hit with second. Uh, and this is this ability is very powerful. Uh, so uh, so this is part of the reason why why Concerted Strike is so high on the list, I think. And Concerted Strike is is a really powerful card in a vacuum as well. So um, I just I can only say that I advise to pick Concerted Strike almost always, very often uh, when you play the Masia. Yeah, I think Concerted Strike is great. I play it a lot. Um, I can see why it has such a high win rate. Okay, and then as a last discussion point, we can look at the strongest champions from win rate. Let me. Um, and the strongest one here is without a question and unsurprising to most people. Lux and Lux is just, I always say that Lux is very powerful and I really like playing her. I used to have a very high win rate of her recently. I got like a one bad run and now I'm like depressed. But she's definitely one of the strongest champions and has also the strongest win rate in the game. Uh, I'm actually a little surprised that Lux is number one. Uh, I was thinking that she's gonna gonna be strong, maybe even something like top five, because uh, Lux is uh, is very strong champion. They, she have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of good cards in the bucket in grand moments, uh, especially concerted strike as we discussed before. Uh, right before. Mm, and uh, and also being Demacia, Demacia is very strong. Lux play patterns are also very good uh, in this meta call. Uh, so I think uh, I think she had to be strong. I'm kind of surprised that she beats champions like Jarvan, Lucian, Shivana. I thought uh, this this ones are going to be better. But uh, but yeah, Lux uh, is great and the spot uh, and the spot right in the top. Uh, a little surprised, but not by a lot, I think. Yeah, the small differences in win rate um, will change from month to month. We don't have huge sample sizes on these, so um, I wouldn't say necessarily this month Lux is definitely the best champion in Runeterra uh, or anything. Um, she's certainly very strong, and since the buff to 5 uh, uh, to five cost, um, she's been getting even stronger. But she is definitely a champion that 
um, is synergistic and you need to build around her with lots of spells. Thankfully, she's in a great bucket with lots of good spell backup, so she's fairly easy to level up. But um, yeah, still, I would say that she's benefiting a lot from her region and her bucket. I think she's strong because she punishes all the other mid range decks running around, like you said. These beefy mid range decks can't deal with Remembrance on three, and with Lux in general having barrier and throwing these free removal spells out over and over again. I think that's just something very powerful. Okay, the next two champions are also in Demacia. First up, we have Charven. So, Charven, of course, always. Very powerful champion. Just today somebody asked in the in one of the discords, why is Charvin not overpowered? He seems so strong. Why does not he play in constructed? And while he's too fair in constructed, he's definitely unfair in expeditions. Since his buffed from 264, he just kills basically everything and allows you to open attack, get insane tempo swings. And then if you ever flip him, which is pretty easy now with the three instead of four, then he just takes over the game and Basically, is the abyss for magic players just killing one unit over and over each time or each turn? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, this this ability to uh, to develop and this uh, Jarvan at the same time open attack is really really strong, and this is part of the reason why Jarvan is uh, uh, is so high on the list. Um, I would expect Jarvan to be uh, for, for my, my personal list before this Balko data had Jarvan also at second place, but before but after Shivana. I was thinking that Shivana is going to be higher, uh, but uh, I I, uh, I actually think that Jarvan is one of the very very best champions in expeditions, and this this combination of the region and uh, and bucket um, ma makes it. It's all about this uh, this great Demacia cards. All of the Demacia champions are very high on this list. Mm, except uh, the, this tree that we can see, we can see like Shivana on eighth place, Queen is eleventh, uh, Fiora is in, in, at nineteenth place, uh, Garen is twenty third. Uh, so and Garen is the lowest, right, uh, out of the champions. So mm, it's uh, it's really powerful region, and uh, we can see this in this win rate. But if you see the Masia, you should probably pick the Masia. I agree. Sadly, Lucian and Garen are the only Demacian champions that are not prismatic yet. We have to change that at some point. But, yeah, you have um, to make Lucian prismatic. Lucian is great. This is a great, great champion. Mm. That's the mystic shot. <laughs> I think I've drafted Lucian like two times not in my if, life. Not, not if you flip him, uh, then he doesn't die to a mystic shot. I think I've drafted him like two or three times in my life. I just don't like the character. Like, it's a stupid yeah. reason, I know, but... <laughs> I, actually, I actually really like Karen, right. so this is, this is uh, <laughs> why I'm really, really confused right now. What do you like about the character? He's like, so boring, and I probably don't, didn't play the LOL campaign, uh, like the, the event, where it's just a dick to everybody. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Come on, yeah, right. leading the Sentinels against the, the Ruined King. Yeah. Yes, I mean the story. Great thing. Great thing to do. What does that mean to everybody? And like, what is this dark goo coming on the level 2 form? What is he shooting like there? What is this? I don't know. I don't like the... I, I, I like him in labs, <laughs> but I don't like him in general. <laughs> Just... You should give him a, tr a try. He's great. He's great. I really like to play Lucian, especially uh, the, the, the opener if you, if, when you have Lucian on 2 and Senna, Sentinel of Light on 3 is very strong and it's really hard to deal with uh, because uh, you deal with one and the other got buffed uh, into a really powerful, powerful monster. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> a monster, it's a human. <laughs> a monster because uh, being so powerful. This ah, is, okay. Uh, a monster. But that's also what I don't like. Like you ha always have to kill up of Senna as on purpose, as fast as possible, like single combat and blocking with her. And I, like I want them to be reunited. I want them to be a couple and not want to be angry that they ever died. Okay, the second Senna. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lucian actually works with second Senna, right? Yes. And I let yeah, Senna I die. Senna. And Senna works with Lucian as well. So if Lucian dies, you are. Darkness Senna Blitz as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty Have cool. you guys played uh, Lucian with the new Senna yet? I've seen a video about it, but not played him 
Uh, yes, I had uh, I had the uh, combination of champions. I played Lucian and Senna, uh, and Senna uh, the darkness one. And I actually had a game that uh, when I flipped Lucian by the Senna dying. Uh, uh, so uh, I I tried that and I uh, saw this happen. Hmm. Okay. I don't think I've been offered um, Lucian and new Senna before. Uh, but yeah, I flipped Lucian off uh, old Senna plenty of times, and then or vice versa as well. Um, so. It's certainly a good strategy. I don't like. I, I don't want to confuse anybody on that. It's, it's for sure a good strategy. I just don't like killing his wife on purpose just to make him work for me. It seems like a weird thing to do. <laughs> That's so. Like it's, I know it's just a card game. Cyan, <laughs> should never play Cyan in, uh, in League of Legends. Why? Like he's at least dead. Like, what does it matter if you reanimate him? <laughs> I think he's uh, he's scaling uh, in League of Legends out of uh, number of deaths, I think. Or something like that. I'm yeah, but sure. he's already dead. Like, you don't kill him on purpose. Like. Okay, technicality. <laughs> uh, let's, let's go to next uh, next channel. Speaking of Noxus, we have LeBlanc very high. Uh, LeBlanc is strong, I think, because uh, because having five attack and quick attack is very powerful. She's really hard to block, even though uh, Conan is going to say right now that she dies to Mystic Shot, but uh, it's not that easy to, uh, to have an answer to everything that Noxus can offer. And if you play Mystic Shot, you don't develop, uh, and uh, Noxus minions. Units can uh, hit you again in the face, played on turn 1 and 2, because you do that. And the blank is fairly easy to flip also, uh, and and uh, and because of that, uh, because of that uh, strong pressure from LeBlanc, uh, and may, this makes her the best Noxus champion on the list, even though Riven is fairly close here. And I have to like say, I don't mind that LeBlanc dies to Mystic Shot, because they always want the Mystic Shot to preparing Glory Seeker on turn 2, so it doesn't matter if you play a lip long, they don't have the Mystic Shot anymore. So I don't care about her being a 2 health that much as I care about Lucian. And yeah, Leblanc is a super strong champion, of course. Actually, when this like releases, day after will be a Mononoxus run with me playing lip long and playing aggressive, so you can look forward to that. Or just watch it. <laughs> watch it in the future um yeah and the next one is actually viego it was really surprising to me that viego is so high on the list because i didn't expect him to be that popular and that strong I actually gave him a pretty bad rating but maybe we have to reassess that because like not bad i think i gave him like a 7 out of 10 but I think I have to reassess that if he is like statistically that powerful. How do you like Viego? Uh, I'm not surprised at all that Viego is so high. Uh, I I think that Viego is very strong. Uh, he was strong in previous back uh, report. I think uh, he was uh, I think top twenty something like that. And now in uh, Pantheon meta, this meta favors him a lot because uh, uh, because if you are in Shadow Eyes, you have access to Vengeance and other cards that can kill Pantheon pretty easily. Um, and this uh, this really helps Viego because uh, when your opponent plays uh, mid range deck and his main Try this patio and you just kill him with crumble or something like that. Uh, then you uh, and then uh, you are uh, start winning on card advantage because they played a lot to uh, flip Pantheon hoping to win the game. And then Viego suddenly uh, is uh, this unbeatable threat for uh, such for such a. Deck. So uh, I think Viego is really strong and it's not surprising to me at all, uh, at all. Uh, and uh, Viego was strong was strong also before. So yeah, uh, this this is quite predictable. Viego is a good meta call right now. Viego is a good pick, uh, partially partially because uh, because of what uh, what you can expect uh, what you can expect uh, from your opponents. I think Viego is strong, but I am surprised by how highly represented he is here. Um, especially when, uh, before when his uh, offering rate was boosted with Shivana, I always thought Shivana carried his weight. Um, but according to these stats, um, it may be the opposite way. Um, I do think Viego is strong, but uh, the vengeance uh, buff um wouldn't be reflected here because i think uh this is from the previous month's data uh so maybe next month viego will be even higher let's see um uh but uh yeah i 
do think that um, he's not that easy to play, maybe, because he's essentially a bruiser that uh, wants to stay alive, um, so he doesn't necessarily get into combat all that much. Um, starting as just a 5-4, um, maybe sometimes 6-5 uh, uh, after getting one buff. Um, he doesn't actually survive in combat uh, as easily as, say, a champion with quick attack. Uh, so you can't attack with him all that much. Um, so you need to make sure that enough things die around him to make sure he constantly gets topped up. And what's also frustrating is that um, his health bug seems to still be around, where um, if he takes some damage and then he gets buffed by the uh, mists, um, the game refreshes his health and it sees something, um, whereas he doesn't actually have full health again. You just need to keep track of that and use the eye. Um, so. Yeah, uh, I lost a game to that bug, so I'm, uh, I know how, how it works. Uh, like, uh, it, uh, he regenerates the health uh, when he gets the buff, uh, so it's uh, it's kind of it's gonna, uh, important to try this. Yeah, I lost the game because of that as well. I thought he had more health and I could block with him uh, against Overwhelm, but I blocked and I just died to so. save. Uh, I actually lost uh, the other way around. My opponent had uh, Viego, and uh, I thought uh, I thought uh, I dealt this damage, so I launched uh, some removal. I don't remember what the, what it was. I think it was like Seal of Malice, I think. Uh, and uh, it ended up that it dealt only two damage to full health of Viego. And I, I was how it happened. Okay. Um, do you know if this bug also exists for Narsis? Because recently had like a Narsis come out of a um, hourglass, and he had two health before, then he went back up to six health. I have not I seen know. that before because I don't see NAS as much anymore and Ancient Hourglass even less in Expedition. So. I actually couldn't test how much health he actually had because he immediately got vengeance, but that was weird. Yeah. Okay, then what else do we have on our list? Zoe is pretty high win rate, which makes me happy. I like Zoe. Yeah, that's, this is something that I find uh, very surprising. I I was thinking that uh, it's possible that uh, Targon champions might be better, uh, but uh, this high Zoe is uh, is kind of something that the that was a little surprising to me. I I'm looking for answers why, and I think uh, part of the reason might be that there's not a lot of uh, removal running around in this Pantheon decks. And Zoe potentially uh, might be uh, able to hit a uh, hit a few times and stick on the board uh, for in a long enough to flip, and then uh, and then after Zoe flips, uh, it's uh, really hard for Pantheon deck to actually uh, close out the game. And this might be the reason why Zoe is uh, quite quite high on the list. Um, the play rate is not that low; it's over a thousand games. So uh, I think it kind of have to be something in it. Um, if we if we combine this. That, that uh, Targon have b much better tools right now, and that Zoe should have good matchup on paper against Pantheon. This might uh, be the reason why Zoe is high on the list. Yeah, and I've always thought Zoe would be good. Like, her bucket is kind of bad, so I rated her down a little bit. But Zoe as a card is definitely, I think, the strongest one drop in expeditions. Like, I would still say Saga Seeker, but I do think Zoe is a stronger one drop, especially since she's a champion. So I've always loved playing her. I have like mastery four and a half with Zoe, just from expeditions mostly, and like two or three constructed games. But yeah, I will definitely be happy to try her out again. And I'm she also is so high as well, um, uh, because I think she is only middling uh, according to Lord Guardian data. Um, and I think this marks a dramatic difference between Balco's data and Lord Guardian's data, where I do think Zoe is quite tricky to play um, and quite skill testing. Uh, and since Balco only uh, tracks data from players who have reached Masters in Constructed or their opponent, um, uh, I'm assuming that those players are generally pretty good with the mechanics and. Uh, understand the ins and out, uh, outs of Zoe, so uh, know when it's time to uh, kind of be uh, casting them uh, super cool star charts, 
uh, when it's time not, sometimes went just to block with Zoe uh, and sacrifice her. So I do find uh, that she's quite tricky to play well. So maybe that's why she scores more highly on Falco's data. Um, one important thing is also to keep track of which cards you have played already. And that's actually really important with Zoe, like just deck building concept that you want to diversify your cards, not just have five Saga Seekers, for example, because it makes you so reverse. And then actually keeping track yeah. of which card you played and which card you didn't play. And like, for example, I have ma even made like little little cards for each Tyrone card and which Celestial card that I can like memorize without even writing it down, what sorry cards I've played so far. And so not, probably most people don't do that, especially beginners. And then they just like play a start shot again and they're like, I'm going to flip my sorry here. And she doesn't flip, so I think Sorry is definitely one of the hardest champions to play. In your experience, do you find Zoe get to flip uh, more or not? Like if she does die, I usually flip on turn 6 or 7 or something. But does she not die? Well, if she doesn't die, like if if she dies, like if they have a Poké Stick or, a Mist or, or the Wild Feast, like for example, then you have to play around it a little bit. You have to pick up. One card I really like with Zoe is um, the, the, the gems, like the... Uh, how is it called? Shield card? No. Special card is bad because it just blocks one spell. I like Astral Protection with Zoe and I really like the Blessing of Targon. Yes, Blessing of Targon is so awesome. I think there might be another explanation actually that we kind of missed in missed here uh, because uh, Targon uh, with the new cards uh, got, got so many so many buffs to health, especially uh, cards like uh, combat trees that, that buffs health and can uh, be played in answer to removal, like we stand together, like pain cascade, pain cascade um, stuff that can uh, keep uh, Zoe alive. And this is maybe part of the reason why Zoe is so high on the list, uh, because right now Tarun have much more options to, um, to keep Zoe alive against removal. And this could make Zoe much more, uh, so, uh, this could uh, raise survivability of Zoe a lot. The main reason why I like Zoe with the Blessing of Targon is because like you play Zoe on turn 1, your opponent's pink spell, like a Wild Feast, costs 2 mana, so they can't play it on turn 1. And then they, on turn 2, they just pass first because they think, aha, he will play a Star Chart, and then I can play my removal spell on Zoe. And then you just pass back, don't play your Star Chart, then you have 5 mana open, you hit them again, then they play Wild Feast, and then you play Blessing of Targon. That's my typical game plan with Zoe. And they have the five banner banked up, then you have a four, four, three elusive Zoe, and they have to like vengeance her, which is terrible. Or they just don't have the mana for that immediately. And this is my typical game plan of Zoe. Just never play the start chart unless it's zero mana. And just I make sure he survives. I don't know. I probably would just snap a hit to a fine feast. I would never uh, count on playing start chart because I don't want to spend two mana on start chart. Anyway, so I would not do that uh, if I play Zoe. So uh, if I'm an opponent to Zoe, I would probably stop play File Feast. Uh, so they have less mana to uh, to block my File Feast, like we, we stand together or something. Yeah, I agree with Mizrael. I'm amazed that your opponents try and pass uh, when they have Val Feast because. As the Zoe player, I would not want to play the super star, super cool star chart on turn two. On turn two, I might play just a two drop because uh, I want to add tempo to the board. Um, but I wouldn't want to be playing the super cool star chart on turn two. And then let's let me rephrase this. Um, Wild Feast is actually pretty rare in expeditions. Uh, statistically, I'm more talking about unspeakable horror. And if you play unspeakable horror uh, on turn two, you don't get the nightfall effect out. And I think most players are too greedy for that to not get the nightfall out of it. And would you also play like uh, you, you probably because you're good players would probably play as Beagle Horror on turn two without I the nightfall? Stop, sorry. Yes, I see Zoe. I kill Zoe. There is no, uh, there is no doubt about that. I, I, I'm killing Zoe so fast as Shades kills Lux because he's afraid of the light, right? And he, <laughs> he kills Lux instantly always. So this is the same for me. I kill Zoe instantly. Okay, yeah, but I think most players just don't do that. They want to get value. They want to get nightfall, and I think Zoe is not that big of a threat. In the early turns, then you can get them. But... I think uh, I might be greedy. It kind of depends if I think I can get night for the previous, uh, the next turn. If I think I can do that, then I'll do it. If I don't, then I'm happy just trading my, you know, two cost common spell for their one cost uh, champions. 
despite already getting value out of it and facing Targon. And you're like, oh my god, I'm playing Shadow Alt, and then we just have Star Shapings, and this will be so terrible, and I will lose in the long game. I have to have this Nightfall card to have a chance. My question was, um, Mizrael, do you remember the last time that you've seen a flipped Zoe? Does it happen often? Uh, I think uh, I, I think I did not play Zoe in the recent in previous patch at all. Before uh, before the recent Magical Miss Adventures, I played Zoe. Uh, I played Zoe a few times, and I think uh, she more likely died than uh, than was flipped. I think uh, it was like split 67, 35, 70, 30. Something like that. I think she was more likely to die than to flip. But I think this might be different now in Magical Mystic Adventures because of this all buff spells. And I have to also mention, like, my opponent's Zoe doesn't flip that often, but my Zoe, like, flips more often because, like, Zoe flip basically means you win the game. That's always what I tell people. And, like, if you have any buff that you can spread around, that's half irrelevant. You always win the game with Zoe flip. So that's just my most common way to win with Zoe. And if Zoe dies, then I have, like, infinite value to back it up. So would say my, my Zoe flips like in 50 to 60 percent of the cases but when she flips then I just win the game and yes I'm quite surprised by that I personally don't play Zoe very much and uh I have faced Zoe I guess quite rarely but if I have to put percentage on things I would say 80% of the time Zoe dies and 20% of the time she flips or maybe it might be even Worse than that, in the sense that 90% of the time Zoe dies, 10% uh, of the time she flips, because usually there will be something that manages to kill Zoe, uh, whether it be uh, some damage spell, removal, uh, challenger, or something. So. Yeah, it really depends on how you play her. So I'm lucky that Mistral doesn't play Shadow Eyes that often, otherwise my Zoe would have no chance, obviously. <laughs> uh, I uh, I stuck is try to kill Zoe anyway. Uh, always with everything I have, uh, so um, I I am uh, uh, I'll probably spend like vengeance even to just kill Zoe if I can. Also Shadow Eyes. Yeah, it's yeah. I know it's Shadow Eyes. I sometimes play Shadow Eyes when I play Senna. So yeah. You're going to uh, minimum so her, and then happen. I'm going to have I a sleepy sunburst. blocker. I would sunburst uh, Zoe on uh, three. Uh, uh, wait two turns and sunburst Zoe on three. <laughs> I would give her so much respect. Then I play my Bastion and have fooled you. <laughs> no. Okay, we're like discussing Zoe a lot. Is there anything else you or any other champion you are surprised by? Like I'm a little bit surprised by Sivir. That's one of the like. Um, Arthur and I have already like concluded our ratings pretty much. And this is a card we disagree on. I think Sylvia herself is pretty strong. I rated her like a like we would rate her if just a card, like a nine or something. But I think her bucket is just so bad with the rock bears and stuff. That I had to go down a little bit on the grade because I don't think if you pick up Sylvia in the first pick, you ever really have that high of a, su a chance of success unless you really move out of the Sylvia bucket, just draft her as a support champion and like the long decks, for example. Sivir was also very high in uh, previous Balco data. I think around the same position. I think around the, at the eighth place. And I think this is uh, this is actually uh, her position in the in the list. I think she's very strong, uh, by far the best uh, shooting match champion. Her effect, uh, she's very easy to flip, and her effect is mega powerful. Uh, it's quite similar to Zoe in some uh, in some instance, mm, and uh, this effect is very powerful, and she's uh, me mega easy to flip. If she would be in a better region, she would be easily the best champion in the game. If uh, CV would be the master, I think. Uh, this is the reason why CV is so strong. Um, and Shurima actually have some good cards and some options to have a good curve. I right now in, in Constructed, try to make Mono Shurima work with CV. Uh, and uh, and the, there are some cards that you can uh, have to make work uh, severe, and you probably shouldn't really be focused on severe bucket. Even though it feels a little strange to me why severe bucket is bad when both severe and Leblanc are so high, uh, even though the bucket is bad, uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, CV is mega strong, uh, and it's at all no, not a surprise to me. It's uh, it's the same in uh, this and previous uh, Balco report. Uh, it's not something that uh, that uh, would shock me if CV stay uh, stay the same in next uh, report as well. I think Sivir herself, the individual card, is very strong. 
um, for all the reasons that we talked about LeBlanc being strong. Uh, Severe is that as well, um, in addition to having Spell Shield. Uh, so, essentially, the only good way of uh, stopping her is with challenges. And uh, with that, three attack challenges is not that easy to come by. Um, uh, ones that will trade effectively in terms of cost with Severe is very hard to come by. And even when they do, then maybe um, the Severe player has some way of protecting Severe, uh, whether through a buff or maybe removing their challenger or something. So uh, Severe is very hard to counter against. Um, if you say Severe's bucket is weak, I'll take your word for it. I don't know what's in Severe's bucket, um, but I'll pick Severe because she's a strong uh, card. And then if I get offered more from Severe's bucket, I'll just pick other good cards out of other buckets. I'm just not going to pick up cards from Sivir's bucket. I don't see a, uh, any reason why I have to do that. So. Yeah, I just yeah, want yeah, to take that, that in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's really true. We just wanted to uh, to factor it uh, because uh, it's uh, unusual for these champions, uh, I think. Uh, all these champions have pretty good buckets uh, up there, I think. Uh, so it's uh, quite unusual. But uh, yeah, but I agree if Arthur would do exactly the same. I would pick Sivir and uh, uh, build, uh, build her with other surely much cards or even cards from different regions because she's uh, really strong as an individual card. I would also do that. Just an example, what cards live there. It's like Payday, like the physical card of Payday, Inner Sanctum, and all of the Rock Bear cards. So Salt Spires, for example, and the other Rock Bear card. I don't even know what it's called anymore. Hibernating Rock Bear. There's a Naturalist lives there, which of course is like a little bit better now, but it's just a really weird bucket. It has like eight different four drops in it, and... One, one Wait, drop. you have Bloodthirsty Marauder, you have Treasure Sea cards, not that bad, you have Wave of Judgment. Yes, you have some yeah, good cards, but the bad like cards overweight. Like, you have five good cards and the rest is like, like five yeah, good cards, desert, five filler. And yeah, the there is Desert good. Naturalist as well. Uh, I think it's a good card, but Conan is not, so I'm not sure. There's a Legend is okay, like, if you're playing Landmarks, it's good, but you don't want to play Landmarks if you want to play Sibia. Like, that's the problem. You want to play like a good curve and aggressive and stuff and not just rock bears. Yeah, that's it. Naturalist on four uh, activated that is good. It's a good curve. Yeah, but like look at the curve. Like it's f- five different four drops or seven different four drops. So you, you will want to play Sivir on four and not like any of the other cards. So it's like pretty bad curve from this bucket as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you have to you have to choose cards from different uh, buckets. Like Endless Devout would be very good. Uh, exactly. Uh, Desert Naturalist. Cards like that. Okay, are there any other champs you want to look at, or should we move to the bottom of the list? Uh, do we want to check uh, second page briefly? Uh, is there is something, uh, something... Okay, here you have the second page now on your screen. What do you find interesting? Hammerdinger is pretty high. That's that's what I find interesting. Yeah. This is uh, this is probably a simple thing. You just pick Hammerdinger on first pick. Great first pick because on second pick you're guaranteed Damasia and after first pick you pick Lux <laughs> and you have Lux game. Uh, this is probably the reason why Hamadinga is so high. Mm, I would uh, Hamadinga is my first pick but not second pick. This is uh, how I would play Hamadinga. I would pick him on first, uh, um, like one of the best champions in the game, and on second uh, would not pick him at all. Except I, I have Damasia already. I like Hammerdinger actually a lot if I build around him. Like, I think he's like, I, I don't think I have like under six win around with Hammerdinger. Because, like, I always build him with Reliot and Frostbites. And it's like pretty well, strong. But, but it's also important to note uh, about Hammerdinger. He's very low play rate. It's only 500 games. So it might be a little biased uh, with that. Uh, this win it might be, might be not very real because of that. That's also true. Same with Draven, who's like. Well, also pretty high, but also has just a 641 win rate. Uh, 641 matches mm-hmm. played. Yeah, there's also one champion that I kind of want to touch here. It's Rumble. Uh, uh, Rumble is a new champion uh, of two expeditions without a boosted play rate. Uh, so we don't see a lot of him. 
I think Rumble is pretty strong. I think it's a strong champion. Uh, the ability to um, to be in such a great threat, and you have to discard only once the three cards, and you can then uh, play another Rumbles with uh, without a discard, and they have a keywords, uh, and they have these keywords. Uh, I think this this is very powerful. You often find cards uh, to discard that are good to discard, uh, like shields from your squires or or, or something. Um, and I think uh, I think uh, this uh, this with the combination of good uh, swarm strategies from Bundle City or good aggro decks from Oxus uh, makes Rumble pretty good. Uh, and uh, I even played Rumble once and, uh, and, and it reached uh, seven wins quite convincingly. I think uh, Rumble is very powerful. Anything you want to touch on, Arthur? On the second page? Uh, nothing in particular. I still haven't had much experience against Rumble yet. And had to play him, um, so okay. But he does make strong points. So then, from the bottom of the win rate here, I find it funny that Pike is like super up. Even in the bottom of the bottom, he's like even lower with a thirty-five percent win rate. And yeah, sadly, Ari with a high play rate, but also super low win rate. And I fold her bucket for that because this would be the like this would be the counter argument with like Sevier, like. Why do people then, if, if the bucket doesn't matter, then why is Ari so low? I think Ari is individually, uh, as a card, is much worse than Sivir is. Yeah, I agree with Arthur. This is the reason Ari is just uh, much worse as an individual card. I was thinking that Ari would be much better uh, because the ability to buff her and attack through elusives uh, to potentially OTK opponent. Uh, looks strong on paper, but it's uh, not really doable consistently, and uh, this is why Ari is so low on the list. The sad Aurelia is so low now. She was really uh, so great upon release, but better nerf Aurelia. Uh, nerf after nerf, and she's finally at uh, the bottom of uh, Expeditions, which is sad. Yeah, my, my my choice would be just to switch the Aurelia bucket with the um, Ari bucket, like just straight up switch them, maybe put the support cards over, then Aurelia only has one spell and progressive palm, and Ari has all of the good like uh, recall cards and stuff that would fix both champions at once. Maybe change maybe, the names as well. Maybe they don't want to do that because... Uh... Because it's pos it's a possibility that uh, Riot don't want to repeat the the experience of uh, of ladder uh, from uh, either now with uh, a lot of Ari and even uh, and before from uh, Azirelia uh, decks. So uh, it's possible that it's uh, that these champions are weak on purpose and not uh, because uh, uh, not because uh, it was a mistake from uh, from Riot. Um, not surprised that Lark is really low, uh, both Pike and Rexai. Uh, uh, are the bottom of the list. I, I'm quite surprised of Talia being so low. I think Talia individually is pretty strong card. Not like great, but pretty strong. Uh, but uh, Landmark is just a pretty, uh, it's just a really bad strategy. I would expect Talia a little higher, uh, like um, a few percentage higher than that, uh, than what we see here. So this is uh, a little surprising to me. Uh, Zidian, uh, Zidian, uh, He's not a great champion. Zerat got buffed, so maybe you can see him higher. Uh, and we have on the last page also Nami. Nami got nerfed uh, not that uh, not that long ago uh, because of her things being constructed. So in expeditions, she is uh, one of the worst champions because uh, doing Nami combo deck uh, in expeditions is not an easy feat. So uh, this uh, this translates to win rate. Exactly. So yeah, pretty much what we expected it to be, this list, like no no real big surprises, I would say, some small surprises, but there was no card that we were like totally off on. We were like, for example, if like Maokai would have been 60% win rate or something, that would have been odd. But most of these are pretty much how we expected them to be and predicted them to be, I would say. Okay, and that's going to do it for our analysis of the Balko data. And thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Misrael and Arthur, for joining. It was quite interesting discussing all these cards with you.
and yeah, watch, check out our Discord and tune in next week again. Yeah, F thanks for having me. Uh, we're gonna uh, definitely for prepare something uh, something more for next week. Hope for some uh, new news from Riot about uh, about this year uh, this year in Legends of Runeterra. Hopefully, hopefully some more for expeditions. Yep. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm less hopeful for expeditions. I think <laughs> the next roadmap uh, that I said would be coming. Um, is now expected for after the uh, Bandal City is finished, so potentially in February. That's so nice. the next patch, I think, is uh, expected to be a small uh, patch. So I wouldn't expect anything major from that. Okay.